Okay, welcome back. This is the part one of two on atoms, molecules, and bonding, and how that relates to biology. So we're going to go ahead and get study for, get started with why you even study chemistry in biology. Well, the structural substance of living material can be understand, understood through chemistry. The information system of life based on DNA can be understood through chemistry. The energy to support life comes from the sun and can be understood through photochemistry. And the mechanisms to transform that energy into useful quantities are all chemical. So to understand living systems, you must understand the molecular and chemical nature of life. The first thing that we look at with atoms, molecules, bonding, etc. is what an element actually is. There are two basic formal definitions of what an element is. Aristotle, who lived from 384 to 322 BC, said that everything is either an element or composed of elements. An element is that into which other bodies can be resolved and which exists in them either potentially or actually, but which cannot itself be resolved into anything simpler or different in kind. That's a bit wordy. Um, Robert Boyle in 1627 to 1691 said an element is a substance that will always gain weight when undergoing chemical change. Neither of those two really match what the essence is. They do and they don't. It's, it's hard to understand what they're actually saying. An element basically is something that can't be broken down into something uh, smaller. That's the basic component of what an element is. So, um, well, that's any non-nuclear reaction, I should say. So there are six elements that account for 98% or more of the mass of all living organisms on this planet. Other elements are important too, but are present in small quantities. The first one is sulfur, and here's a picture of sulfur as a mineral. The next one is phosphorus. And phosphorus is something that you find in a lot of different things, but mostly in our lipids and also in our nucleic acids. Oxygen is the next one, and this is its liquid form. Nitrogen is next. Ooh, sorry. Carbon is after that, and you can see carbon comes in two flavors. It comes in diamonds and in graphite, basically. And then finally, hydrogen, which is the stuff of which stars are made. So um, these six elements account for 98% plus percent of uh, the mass of all living things on this planet. Keep in mind that these go in order from least at uh, least... Um, proportion to most proportion. So in other words, the most uh, the most elements you'll see in the human body, for example, will be hydrogen. Sulfur will be the least of the top six. Atoms are the smallest forms of matter that retain the chemical characteristics of a given element. Atoms have a nucleus which contains protons and may contain neutrons. And it has clouds of electrons that surround the nucleus. Protons have a plus one charge and a mass of one atomic unit. And I'm talking in biology terms. It's a lot more specific when we talk in chemistry terms. But for biology, protons weigh one and they have a plus one charge. Neutrons have a zero charge. They have no charge, but a mass of one atomic unit. So they weigh one, but have zero charge. And electrons, in biology terms, have essentially no mass and have a negative one charge. So you can see that the charges are balanced out between the electrons and the protons, and the mass is almost all protons and neutrons located in the nucleus. And that's going to give each element its specific properties, and those properties are maintained on the periodic table. The columns in the periodic table refer to the number of valence electrons, which are the electrons in the outer shell. These are the ones that are actually the chemically reactive parts. Column 1 elements have only one electron in their valence shell, for example. These elements easily give up that electron because it's just kind of wobbling out there by itself. 
columns 5, 6, and 7 elements need 3, 2, or 1 electrons respectively to fill their outer shells and are called electronegative because they pull electrons, remember they have a negative charge, they pull electrons from other elements. And column 8 elements have full outer shells and are considered inert because they don't need to react to fill their valence shells. Now, that is and it isn't true. We can make them react, but it's very difficult to do so, and it's only under specific conditions. Now remember that the mass is located inside the nucleus of the atom, and that's made of the protons and the neutrons. When we look here at an element from the periodic table, you'll see it's got two numbers. It's got the top number, which is the atomic number, and that is equivalent to the number of protons in that nucleus. The atomic number defines what the element is. If the number of protons changes, the element changes, period, the end. If you have different number of protons, you have a different element. The number of protons plus the number of neutrons equals the atomic weight or atomic mass. In an uncharged atom, the number of protons is going to equal the number of electrons. Now, I want you to look at this atomic weight. It says 12.011, and I just told you that protons and neutrons both weigh 1. So why the difference? Well, because there are different forms of different atoms, um, they actually combine to make an average mass. So if you're figuring out how many neutrons there is, you're going to round. So this is 12.011. You're just going to round it to 12 and say 12 minus 6 equals 6 neutrons. Okay, we're going to pick up the rest of this activity when we're going to start talking about isotopes in part two of this lecture, and I hope you have a fantastic day.